Burbank is perhaps best known as a media hub and a place where films are made. The library does occasional programs like this one tonight that are intended to celebrate that history and association. We hope our events will be of interest to those in the film business, but we also hope to foster a greater appreciation by everyone at Burbank about an industry that is so economically important and culturally important to this city. We try to do this by presenting events that take you behind the scenes at the making of a particular movie and help you understand how people come together to make a film. The Big Goodbye does that, but as I'm sure you will hear from Sam tonight, the author, one of the major themes of his book is that how people come together to make a film, how the practice and business of making movies is organized, has a lot to do with whether or not creative and talented people are able to make good or great film. On that matter, The Big Goodbye has something to say uh, that we should all hear, um, all of us who care about the future of film and its place in our lives. The New York Times bestselling author Sam Wasson is the author of six critically acclaimed books on show business. A Splurge in the Kisser, the movies of Blake Edwards, Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m., Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and The Dawn of the Modern Woman. It's a long title. I, was, I never read it all the time. Paul on Mazursky, a collection of conversations with the director. Fosse, which inspired the Emmy-winning FX miniseries, Improv Nation, How We Made a Great American Art. And now, The Big Goodbye, which I just heard, made the New York Times bestseller list today. <laughs> Congratulations, Sam. His eloquent commentaries on film have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the New Yorker. Howard Hawk Koch is a veteran movie producer involved with the making of more than 60 major films. Among them, Heaven Can Wait, Marathon Man, Rosemary's Baby, Gorky Park, the list goes on and on. Mr. Koch is a former president of both the Motion Picture Academy and the Producers Guild. He serves on the board of the Motion Picture and Television Fund, AMC Theaters, and Cast and Crew. Uh, but he's not here tonight for any of that. <laughs> he's Sam's guest tonight because he was the first assistant director on Chinatown. And I also might add, the rock and tour are some of the best stories in The Big Goodbye. He is also, I should add, the author of an engaging memoir, Magic Time, My Life in Hollywood, that was published last fall. And we have some copies available, too. Uh, please join me in welcoming Sam Wasson and Hawk Koch to the Burbank Public Library. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hello? Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? Can you hear us? Yeah. You were the AD on China? I oh, was no, that AD. was me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so here we are, and we're thrilled that all of you came. And uh, why am I here? Uh, I'm here because uh, I think about three years ago I got a call from a friend of mine saying, uh, hey, I've got this young guy who's going to write a, a, move, a, a book about... Uh, I don't know, the 70s, I think he wants to talk about Chinatown, would you meet with him? And uh, I said, sure. And we sat down at a restaurant, and I fell in love with him. I just, he is so, he's so good at his research, he's such a good writer, and as a researcher, he's unbelievable. And I really loved hanging with him, and he brought me back to all my stories about Chinatown. <laughs> and then we met again and again, and we became friends. And so uh, I'm just here as, as a, a kind of person to kind of, we're just going to chat. There's not really a, you know, list of questions. But I think the first thing I wanted to ask Sam is, why Chinatown and why does, what does the good goodbye mean, the big goodbye mean? So And, and, and why Chinatown? Yeah. Well, um, it, was, it was really easy because when Trump won, it was just, that was it. <laughs> it was it was that easy. It was not it was not a long drawn out moment. I was sitting with my friend Graham in his house in Silver Lake, 
and we ordered in some food and we were feeling really confident and and then around Virginia, I think it was Virginia. I can't remember. Was it Virginia? It was around no, Virginia. Pennsylvania, I think it was. was it Pennsylvania? Yeah, I think so. For some reason, Virginia in my mouth. Anyhow, I turned to him, and before I could even make a word out of my mouth, I thought um, what I always do when I'm scared or happy, I guess, when I'm in a state of extreme emotion, which is, what's the movie I'm in now? What's the, what's the precedent for this? Um, you know, like, I, I, I don't ask, I, what's the myth? I could ask what's the myth, but I don't know myth, and I live here, so I ask what's the movie? <laughs> and it was, obviously, it was Chinatown. It was Chinatown at that moment. And, um, and um, then I thought, wow, actually, th there could be a book there, because this is a movie that everyone agrees on. This is not like, no one goes, oh, Chinatown, you know, it's a little long. <laughs> you know, no one, no one complains about Chinatown. Um, and then there was nothing really substantial written. So then it all lined up. And the big goodbye is the big goodbye to Hollywood. And the big goodbye to that America that we lost at the end of the 60s. And the big goodbye to um, the personal Chinatowns that, that we, we say goodbye when we grow up and we, when we see Chinatown emotionally and psychologically for the first time in our life, we have to say goodbye to the innocent part of ourselves that could not have imagined Chinatown. The same way Jake Giddis, who thinks he knew everything, rolled into Chinatown and realized he knew nothing. And at that moment, had to sort of, we don't see it in the movie, but as a metaphor, if we apply it to our own lives, we have to say goodbye psychologically to the old innocent self. So all that came together. It's a sad book, you know, for that reason, an angry book. I'm sad and angry for a lot of the reasons you all are, probably for some extra bonus features. Um, but that's, that's, what, that's what started me on this. And So you had seen Chinatown several times or once or? I was not a Chinatown obsessive mm -hmm. until after the idea and I realized how many levels I realized how much was going on, you know? Having gone to film school, we were raised on Chinatown is the, you know, it's the Torah. You have to go to Chinatown and kneel. And, 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 and it, it, it is scripture to us. And, and uh, so I did that. But then when I got into the psychological and when I got into the Trump then I really saw, oh my God, these guys, they, these guys, they, they made a movie that is more appropriate. I mean, do you think it's even more... Yeah, it's mean, more meaningful today. Right. Tell me, obviously there were a lot of surprises that you didn't know. Yeah. What was the first thing that when you were researching you went, oh my God, I had no idea? I think the first thing was... You can't hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Why don't we get the other one? All right. Well, I'll get the other one. I'm an AP. Right. Yeah. That's, what I'm <laughs> that's the movie business. Keep talking. Um, uh, uh, let's see. The big surprise in this book was when I, I found out uh, that I, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Edward Taylor who was uh, worked as Robert Towns' editor, to use Robert Towns' term for him. We're getting some feedback up here. Feedback from this one. We should have done a mic check. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> it's off again. Oh, there you go. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Welcome to beautiful downtown Burbank. I'm Carson. Oh, it's another. Uh, um, I, uh, I found out that Robert Town worked with a fellow named Edward Taylor um, to write to write this and many other uh, town screenplays. And that was a startling and scary moment, especially given the fact that this was scripture. And uh, for many years, we've all believed one thing. And now I found out is that... Sam, your, your volume's uh, cutting in now. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Hello? Here. Yeah, let's turn, turn that one off. Yeah, 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 of course. And I'll turn mine off. And we'll just trade this, trade off on this one. We're still getting feedback on this one. Um, 
Yay. Okay. There you go. All right. So, so when I found out about Edward Taylor, uh, which is the fellow that Robert Town called his editor, a, a person who Town only referred to once in all printed um, interviews that he gave um, in the course of I don't know how many years it's been forty six years of Chinatown. Um, he called him in the sole interview I found my Mycroft Holmes, my Edmund Wilson, my Jiminy Cricket. And let me assure you, having found the notes, um, he was far more than um, any of those um, great individuals. Um, that was the big well, revelation. Yeah, and I, I, as you heard, I was the assistant director on it, and I had known Roman since Rosemary's Baby. And uh, I would go over to town's house or office or whatever, and there was this guy there named Ed who said, you know, what would you like for lunch? I, you know, I, I'm hearing this for the first and, time. But, you know, I, he was a buddy and he was a friend and he'd sit around, but he never talked about scripts. So it wasn't until I read your book and I called you right yeah, you did, I remember that. And went, oh my God, are you kidding? Yeah. That Ed Taylor? Yeah. Yeah. That Ed Taylor. Which was a gratifying moment for me personally because you start to go into a gaslight frame of mind where you're thinking, I know something and everyone else is telling me it's not right. No one else knows about it. And you start to doubt yourself and uh, could I be crazy? You know, all of that kind of vertigo stuff starts going on. So Hawk was one of the first people to read it. And when he read it, he said, oh my God, that guy was... Now Ed is no longer with us. Right. So... Um, and when the first question I asked is, wait a minute, you know, because I was doubting this. Yeah. How much research did you do and how sure are you that in fact... And then your answer was, I went, wow, that's the truth. Yeah, I... Um, I found the notes. I spoke to uh, Ed's widow, uh, daughter, stepdaughter, best friend, former writing partner, and um, Town's ex-wife, who was a witness to Ed coming and going all the time. Um, but even without any of that testimony, I found the well, notes. Research at the yeah. Academy Library. Huh? I, I researched the Academy Library, where I, I, I. Um, Town was married to a woman named Julie Payne, who we just lost, uh, who was herself the son of Anne, the daughter of, of, of Anne Shirley and John Payne, uh, if you remember the, the, the actors. Um, her folks split, and her mom started going out with um, and married screenwriter Charles Lederer, um, who was a partner of Ben Hecht. In fact, Hecht and Lederer wrote His Girl Friday. Um, so, I was looking for town papers, snooping around like Jake Giddis, looking for town papers, and I couldn't find any. But I thought, well, maybe they're letterer papers, because maybe Julie gave letterer papers, and maybe, you know, stuff was never, stuff isn't always cataloged properly, you find in libraries, you think, I'm sure that's not the case here. <laughs> but, but it, it, you know, like I've gone to the Library of Congress, and they have so much coming in all the time just voluminous archives. They can't possibly keep up with all this material. So sometimes you, as a researcher, you're the first one to ever look at this stuff, you know, who's not the family. So I found in these archives stuff that, that was misfiled. And that led me to uh, th these notes. And I said, whose handwriting is that? And follow the, you know, follow, follow the water. Right. Yeah. So the, the book really is in... Four, it talks about four people, Polanski, Nicholson, Evans, and Town. And it's what I kind of, what I love is kind of wonderful is uh, he kind of talks about each one of their histories as they were getting to making of Chinatown and then into the making of Chinatown and then after Chinatown, or at, at least the opening of Chinatown. So uh, other than that surprise, as you investigated each one of these icons of our industry, were there things that that you know uh, we've all heard uh, about this dog? Uh, we know this, you know, kids say some pictures. But were there things that each one of them? Maybe you could talk about things that you were going, wow, you know. What, what, there were there any wow moments uh, or learning? Polanski, I've been obsessed with for such a long time that. I, I've been kind of practicing this. 
Um, the wow moment was when I spoke to him and, and, and enjoyed speaking with him as much as I hoped I would. Um, that was the wow moment for Polanski. Right. Um, um, uh, for Evans, the wow moment was, this is a guy who was a great producer and was not, was not the image of himself that he created to his own advantage and detriment. I think the idea, the image of Bob Evans was something he created and, and it worked for him and it worked against him. And it's easy to not, it would be easy if you didn't know Evans and didn't know how hard he worked and didn't know what his vision was. As Hawk knows, having worked with Evans going back to Rosemary's Baby, um, what a master producer he was. And I regret only that um, uh, people, folks, probably less so in this room in Hollywood, but folks out there in the world think of him sort of as a cartoon. He's not. Um, and with Jack, yeah, do you want to comment on that? I, mean, just, was, I just, Sam said to me when, in, in the early process, gee, I wish I could, you know, talk to Evans. And because I was still in touch with Bob, I said, well, I'll bring you over. And we drove to Evans' house. Yeah. And... That was one of the best days of my life. Yeah. <laughs> his mouth was all the way down to his yeah. knees. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. talk about walking into Bob Evans' bedroom. Yeah. It just... Evans' How bedroom? That? Well, you, you walk... Well, when I met Evans, which was, what, three years ago, yeah. you... You walk into Evan's bedroom and he's he's in bed. He wasn't moving around much, you know, anymore. But he's in bed and he's he's had makeup. He's he's, got, he's, he's had his makeup. Tan, tan, tan his sure. tan makeup. And sometimes I saw him in a tuxedo shirt, in bed, and a baseball hat. <laughs> I mean, that was Evan's tuxedo shirt and a baseball hat. That's actually per. That's yeah. that's who this guy was. Yeah. I mean, just delicious, and. Um, um, you would walk in, and you would be you would be seated by Alan the Butler, right by Evan's bedside, and there would be delicious, delicious uh, iced tea. The secret of which is orange juice. I had to find out just a little bit of orange juice in the iced tea, and don't tell anyone. And um, and then you sit and you hang out with Evans, and I immediately threw my questions out the you know out the window, and it was a, it was an immediate. Hang out, and the guy came through. You know, is when you got questions for someone, you just ask them the questions. You just get information back. But when you when you hang out with someone, like I did with you, like I did with Evans for hours, when you hang out with someone, you get what can't be said. You know, you get the human being, and that's really what you want to. That's really what I try to get. Otherwise, it's just you know facts. Well, that's one of the great things about making films is that when you make a movie wherever you go in the world to make a movie, you're not a tourist. So you go to Paris to make a movie, and a tourist, oh, they'll take you to the Eiffel Tower, or to Champs-Élysées, or whatever. But when you're making a movie, you actually talk to the people who live in the town, which is kind of what you're talking... Their, their guard is down, because yeah. they are part of making the movie. And I think with Evans, he, he, he let his guard down with you, and you saw the real Bob Evans. Yeah, I, I think I think so. It's so hard to tell with Evans what the real Evans is, but oh, uh, that's the Evans. That, 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 that's it. Yeah. I saw it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> now, yeah. now, this was a man who loved movies and who was romantic. Yes, he was romantic. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so you got to talk to them. I I don't. Did you ever? You didn't talk did, to Jack, to or, Jack. Or, or or Bob. I spoke to. I called Sandy Bressler, who's Jack's agent of. For, forever. Well, yeah, Jack, very loyal. He's only had one agent, Sandy Bressler. Right? That's amazing. So that's all you need to know about Jack. I mean, that was, that's the amazing thing about Jack. One of the amazing things. Um, so I called Bressler. He said, he said, it ain't going to happen. And I said, well, let me just run, now that I have you on the phone, <laughs> let me just run my Jack ideas by you. You tell me if I'm going to Yeah, right, yeah. You just tell me if uh, I'm getting it right. And he said yes. So I felt that was good enough. And town, I, uh, town, you know, I was given, I was told he was busy. And I tried, you know, repeatedly, and maybe he was, and I don't know. But I must say, when you see, when you read the book, you did great, great coverage, great, great 
research about town and you got them pretty good. Well, thankfully, you know, like all these guys, town has been on the record about this movie yeah. for 46 years. Yeah. So, and town has been famous for 46 years. So, he's well covered. Right. Just want to tell a Nicholson story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for a yeah, yeah, please. No, just, just that uh, China, Chinatown was nominated for 11 awards. And I think uh, Godfather to Oscars, and so was Godfather. And Godfather was winning everything, and it was time for best actor. And it was either Nicholson or Pacino. Pacino or Nicholson. And everybody's on the edge, who's gonna win? And I was fortunate enough to be sitting behind Jack. And the lady who announced the winner, and the Oscar goes to Art Carney for <laughs> Harry and Tonto. <laughs> <laughs> and I leaned forward to Jack and I said, gee, Jack, I'm so sorry. You so deserved it. And he turned back to me and he said, that's okay, Bullhorn. I'm a shoe in next year for Cuckoo's Nest. <laughs> and he won the next year. You talk as the, the greatest Jack Nicholson story, one of my favorite Jack Nicholson stories, because it tells you who this man was. The story about um, the, 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 you know, the basketball game. Do, it's a long do, story. You, do you do you do you have it in you or do oh, you, sure. you want to do that? This is uh, you probably haven't heard this. This is Jack. So so it's and uh, Roman. Uh, in in those days, there was what they call a knockdown. Trailers were on the movie <laughs> set. How are any of you in the industry? Raise your hands. Oh, okay. Well, you guys know. Everybody knows. Remember the old knockdown trailers that were on the stage? And Jack had one, and it was like Wednesday, and he said to me, "Hey, Bullhorn," he said, "You know." Friday, the Lakers are playing the Celtics in Boston. Can you find one of those little TVs that I can put in my in my knockdown trailer so when I'm not shooting, I can watch the game? And I had one of those little black and whites with the with the rabbit ears. Remember those? And so I, I brought it in Friday morning, and we're shooting. And every Friday night, Roman would give a party at his house with a different theme. He'd have he'd have Japanese food, and he'd have uh, uh, the the geishas. Or he, he, we do, you know, Mexican food was the not that night, and he was going to have mariachis, you know, and he'd always invite friends and a lot of people from the crew. So we're on the last shot of the night. Jack's been watching my TV in his trailer, and we're doing a scene where Jack is looking at the photographs at the Department of Water and Power. So it's focus marks back to Jack, back to the photos. We're, you know, it's about six twenty, and we're going to shoot and, and go home, go to the party. And uh, John Alonzo, our DP, says, okay, ready. So I said to my second AD, a woman, by the way, all the way back in 1974, her name was Michelle Adair. I said, Michelle, go get Jack. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and Michelle comes back quietly. It's in the fourth quarter, it doesn't want to come. <laughs> so I, I said, I said, oh, come. And Roman went, howdy, howdy. Come on, go get Jack. Come on, it's, it, look, we, we got a party. Come on. So I go back to Jack. I said, Jack, come on, man, we're on the last shot. It won't take forever. I can't. Yeah, and he closes the door and he locks the door. And I'm outside. And I said, Jack, come. You know, and I said, we got the whole crew here. And he said, I'll be out. And, oh, my God. I said, what happened? He said, overtime. <laughs> Jerry West just hit a shot. <laughs> So I go back to Roman and I tell Roman we're just gonna have to wait a few minutes because it's overtime. Overtime, everybody's in overtime. Who's <laughs> in overtime? Right? So a few minutes later, I go back and he's saying, "I'm not coming out. I'm not coming out." Roman comes down to the trailer and he's on the outside and he says, "Jack, come on, man. I want. I want to go home. We got a party." And, and all of a sudden, Jack goes, "Oh!" And but what happened? Double over. <laughs> So Roman changes and says, "Okay, Jack, double overtime. All right, I'll watch the sh I'll watch the, the double overtime with you. Let me in. Oh, no, Roman, I know you. No, no, Jack, I'm, I'm serious. Let me watch it with you. You sure, Roman? You promise? Yeah, absolutely. So Ro Ro Jack opened the door, and right inside the little trailer was my TV. Roman took the tra the wow. TV and threw it all the way across the stage floor. It broke into a million pieces. Jack, who was wearing one of those great suits that he wore in Chinatown, 
took the jacket off and threw it at Roman and said, I won't say what he said, but a lot of truck drivers know some of the words he said. And he threw his jacket at him. Roman, who had a jacket himself, threw the jacket at him. Listen, you actor, blah, 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 blah. Jack took his shirt off and threw it at him. Roman took his shoes off and threw them. They got all the way down to their underwear. Because in AD, I yelled, rap. <laughs> They ran off the stage, and I'm thinking, you know, we never got the shot. And I, about an hour later, I'm thinking, geez, should I go to this party? What's going to happen? Oh my God, are we going to have Jack on Monday? You know, what? How, how are these two guys going to ever work together again? And I go up to Roman's house, and Jack and Roman are dressed. They've got their arms around each other. They're having a great time. And I said, to, I said, what happened? He said, well, they got to the corner of Melrose and Gower. And they were both naked, you know, and, and they looked at each other and they laughed. And, they, and they, they said it was funny. And I said, yeah, it was really funny. And I lost the TV. <laughs> and the next morning at 10 o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on my door and it was Roman's assistant with a new colored little Sony TV. <laughs> That's a great story, not just because it's a great story, but because... For me, I listen to that story and I think, what's that story really about? If I put that story in the book, it's just an amusing anecdote, but it, but, which is cool enough, but there's something deeper for me in that story, which is that these people were happy, and they were having a great time doing what they were doing. And it, 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 I then ask myself, why? Why are these people having such a good time doing what they're doing? They're making the grimmest movie you can imagine. Why are they having such a great time? And in fact, that becomes the center of my book, why this is working. And one of the anecdotes that put me onto that actually was not this anecdote. This anecdote supports that, but the anecdote that puts me on that put me onto it was actually also Hawk's anecdote, um, um, which I read before I even met Hawk. And it was on Chinatown after filming my, my sister, my daughter scene. Um, I'm not going to tell it, but um, um, it was uh, um, staged. It was when you walked oh. broke for lunch, and and would you tell them what sure. you saw when you broke for lunch? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, how many of you have ever seen the movie Sunset Boulevard? Sure. Okay. All right. So just have that in your mind. And we are shooting on one stage on the Desi Lu side of Paramount. We're shooting the My Sister My Daughter scene. Roman Polanski. Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunaway. Next to us, John Schlesinger is shooting the movie premiere scene for Day of the Locust. Academy Award winner, John Schlesinger, with all of those extras and the premiere stuff. And right across the street, Coppola is shooting the Senate hearing room scene for Godfather Two. With Pacino, Michael V. Gazzo, right, the old man who sat there and the whole thing. And so it was like, this was Hollywood. And we all broke for lunch at the same time. And all three with different different costumes, a little bit different age times. And we're all walking down to the commissary. And it was like, wow, this is Hollywood. And I've never seen, to, to what you're talking about, I've never seen that again. That was the essence of, yeah, we were making we were making the magic of Hollywood. That's what my book is, is, is a celebration of, of that. I mean, it, it wants to put, it, it's, it's a elegy, eulogy. It's, uh, it, that, that's what I wanted to write about beyond Chinatown. Chinatown's really an excuse to get into that moment and say, what was happening here, 1973, four, Five, it starts to taper. Things start to change. Jaws, you know, Jaws being a seventy-five. Um, um, what, am I, what should I say? Threshold moment, before and after moment. But a lot of other things too that I found out. CAA was seventy-five. ICM was seventy-five. Um, Evans left Paramount in seventy-five. Cali left Warner's in seventy-five. Um, and. Um, that starts to be the begin. Jaws, obviously. Um, 
Saturday Night Fever, I don't know if it was 75, but, later. 76, but it's the beginning of Saturday Night Fever, it's the beginning of yeah, Star Wars 76, so, 77, so, but this was a, Chinatown had it all before the decline. So that anecdote was to me, oh my God, Paris in the 20s. And it was, it really was. And it's not a nostalgic position. It's not a sentimental position to say, this happened and it doesn't happen anymore. I mean, go to Paramount today. It's a, it's a television studio, you know, if that. It's a television studio and a gift shop. And, 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 uh, and, and I say that. Well, what they do at Warner's and Paramount, because I talked to what Paramount was doing, because Warner's was doing, if you go down to the Warner Brothers lot, Next to the stage, there's a list of the movies Thank that were God. Got on Thank that God stage. that's there. And it's wonderful. Yes. And Paramount does it too. Yes. I don't know if any of the others are doing it, but. I think Warner's does it too. Well, Warner's does it in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And it is the most holy moment you can have yeah. at a studio now. Yeah. But you walk by and it's not, anyhow, that's what this is about. And, right. and uh, so that comes back to you too. Why don't you talk about, uh, a lot of people have talked about the ending of Chinatown. And in your book, why don't you talk about, because you really delved into what the ending was going to be and how it changed and why it changed. That might be interesting. Well, town, town is a romantic and Polanski is, I'll call him a realist. A realist. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's, on top of being a realist, he's Polanski. I mean, he's seen hell. He's seen hell many times. And um, he was not about to say, you know, he, he was not about to pull his punches on this ending. If Chinatown represents, as Town himself described it, the futility of good intentions, a beautiful phrase, I think, the futility of good intentions, how could Town let anyone get away? Or anyone get off? Or anyone have any kind of uh, glimmer of a happy ending, which is what he wanted originally. He wanted, I believe, um, the girl, the daughter to get away, the daughter to get, get across the border, you know. Um, and, and Roman said... And Faye and uh, Evelyn Mulray was going to... She was going to get, shoot, sh you're right, shoot, shoot John Houston. She was going to shoot her father. Right, right. And, and so... But she was going to get away with the daughter. She, right. That's it. She right. was going to get away with the daughter, right. So you watch the movie and you think, okay, so the lovers aren't together and the world was a, it was a scarier place than I ever thought it could be because of sister-daughter and the level of corruption. But at least, you know, you know, we'll always have Paris. <laughs> and, and, um, <laughs> and, and, and um, Roman was going, what are you talking about? What are you, how can you make this movie about the futility of good intentions? And, um, and have a somewhat, somewhat happy ending. And have a somewhat happy ending. And Roman also said a great thing, you know, he said when he remembered going to see Of Mice and Men in Krakow as a boy, he was a boy when he saw it, and he remembered walking out. Right? And, he, and he said, you know, you'll never forget when a tragedy works, you'll never forget, you'll never forget it. And um, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. And so let's let's have them never forget it. You know, let's traumatize them. <laughs> and and the movie has traumatized us. And it should. It's about trauma. It's about not being able to get out of your own cycle. You know, you remember Jack has Chinatown in his past. He's doing this again. And his the futility of his good intentions. Exactly. Exactly. And Come on, Jake. Yeah. It's giant. Yeah, no, 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 forget it. Yeah. Forget it. And how, on a, how, I mean, that's a European, that takes a European to say there's nothing you can do. You know, we're all about, supposedly, you can do anything. Not today. Not today. So I saw that thing, I went, ah, oh, yes. It took, it, took a, it, took a, it took a boy who knew what fascism was uh, to say that dream is just a dream sometimes. Right. Um, and I think that's part of why this movie so lodges in us as Americans, because it's a real, it's a real no-no, this, this ending. Uh, um, and so I don't think anyone's matched it. I mean, even 
an American film, maybe. The in an American film, in an American film. I mean, Kiss Me Deadly comes to mind, but it doesn't, it doesn't slay you, Kiss of Kiss Me Deadly. It doesn't, it doesn't rise to. The, it doesn't rise to the same level of. Uh, I don't. I don't want to speak about it. I haven't seen it in a while. I'm just you know. Well, there's also because of, in my estimation, making films is a collaboration. And we have the best of the best in every department. Oh my God. Richard Silbert uh, yeah. was, one of, was one of the great production designers. His, his sister-in-law at the time, Anthea, amazing costume designer. And Hawk scouted those locations, which form our identity as Angelinos because they were in Chinatown, you know? Hawk scouted those locations with well, Silbert. I, I was lucky because as a 16-year-old, in order to have a car, I had to get a job. So I was given a car if I worked, and my job was to deliver liquor in Los Angeles over Christmas. And, you know, big baskets and stuff, and there was a, a, a liquor store, and I had Thomas Guy, and there was me and one other guy, and we both were like 16, and the guy made us like a challenge. Who can deliver them quick enough and get back for the next load? And I learned the city of Los Angeles and everywhere around because, you know, that's what I knew. So, Town and Polanski were fighting every day about the script, and Dick Silbert and I ran around all over the city looking for those. You picked them up? Picked. You, who drove? You, oh, I drove. You drove oh, in, your, in your brown? Uh, in, 19, in, uh, in 1970. I probably had a lousy brown four-door sedan Audi, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that really chocolate brown. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, and you drove east, obviously, because L.A. gets older the farther east you go, you know? Um, and, um, yeah, it's, it's, and a lot of those, stri a lot of those locations are still there. Yeah. Just people live there. And yeah. Archer School. Archer is, School, is, right. Is, uh, over on Sunset now was, was the, uh, the club. Yeah, the Mar Vista home. Yeah, Mar Vista. The, uh, uh, the retirement home, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I mean, we shot the orange groves in Sydney Valley, which now is probably the Reagan Library or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking down on us. Still there. Some of the orange groves are yeah. still there, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to think of, tell me about, um, or tell the audience, I know some of this stuff. Um, Tell me what it was like to get on the phone with Roman, and what were the questions, and what would he answer, and what would he answer? I, I told him beforehand I wouldn't ask him any questions about Sharon or about the rape case. I would not ask him any about that stuff. And actually, I didn't have any questions about it. It's been so covered. I, 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 it, it would ta have taken me so much research to even find what I didn't know. Um, I really wanted to ask him questions about the, just highly nerdy, nitpicky questions about the movie itself, and a lot about. I talked about Alonzo and a lot about um, the original DP Cortez. Um, Cortez. Yeah, I talked to him. I talked to him about Eddie Taylor. He had never heard of Eddie Taylor. Um, I talked to him, and I asked him a question. This this group might be interested in, which ties back actually to some of the stuff we were talking about. I said, I said, Roman, you took a 300 and something, uh, maybe it was 180 pages by the time Roman got it. Yes. Yeah, 180, right? By the time Town gave it to Evans, it was 350. No. Okay? So then by the time Roman comes in, it's 180. It's still me messy, obviously. We shot, I think it was 134. That sounds absolutely, yeah. And so I said, Roman, you, you took this thing from 180 to 134. You cut out these subplots. You enhanced this. You moved this. You made the script, that we, the ending. I said, why didn't you arbitrate? Why didn't you arbitrate? In other words, to, to get a co-credit. Yeah. A Writer's Guild credit, which is not just about credit, although that's legitimate enough, but it's also about money. You get... You know, you get residuals if you have Writers Guild credit. This is a big thing. This is a livelihood. I said, Roman, why didn't you do this? You could have. Did you feel that you earned it? A, yes, he did. So then, B, given that, why didn't you? He said, because Robert was my friend. 
And that takes me back to the story you told about Jack and Roman and these people were friends. They liked working together and they liked working together because they respected each other and they got to do the work they were excited about doing. They were happy to be there. And one of the reasons they were happy to be there was because Hawk Koch gives, gives them a beautiful schedule. A beautiful schedule. This is not nothing. Well, they, well on Rosemary's Baby, uh, I, was, I was a dialogue coach. I was, what was I, I was 22 or something. And uh, I watched as the, the AD and everybody had given Roman 55 days to make that film. No way Roman Polanski in his first American film was going to shoot that movie in 55 days. And he kept going over. And as he went over, the studio and everybody else started to stress him. And I watched Roman. Roman's not good under stress. He, he, he rebels. Oh, yeah? You think I'm going to be slow? Wait till you see tomorrow how slow I'm going to be. Right? So we went up like 95 days. So when it was time for Chinatown, and I was going to schedule Chinatown, I said to Evans, I'm going to give him more time than he, I, I know how Roman shoots. I'm going to give him more time. And Evans says, uh, uh, you know what you're doing? I'm going to go ahead and do it. And so I scheduled and put up a board for 68 days. And I'll never forget this. We were in Evans' office on Cannon when Paramount was down on Cannon Drive at Lingles. And in those days, for those of you who may remember, there was a big board, of, you know, with my strips. Strips. And Bob was laying on the couch because he had a bad back. And Roman walked up there with me, and I said, "Now, Roman, I've given you two days for how you only need one. I take the two days, Roman. Yes. <laughs> you know." And he said, "And I said, and this for the ending, I've given you three. I don't need three." Take the three days. At any rate, we, we had a 68-day schedule, and we finished the movie in 63 days, and Roman went around everywhere saying, I was under schedule. <laughs> <laughs> this is a major... It's about psychology. This is a major point. This is a major, major point. Because you knew who Roman, how Roman worked based on... Uh, Rosemary's Baby, which only happens when you work together with the same people and you learn each other and how to collaborate, you know, only because of that could you then go to Evans and say he's going to need more and only because Evans was such a good producer that he would say, yeah, all right, I'll buy, I'll buy more time. That's what he's doing. He's authorizing more time. That's not free, you know. We had Dick's Richard Silver, I mean, Virginia Woolf, I mean, you name it, started out with a baby doll with uh, Ely Kazan and Dick I love because because again Roman trusted each one of us when we go to a location and we get out of the car to look at the location Roman would get out and start walking around and Dick would stand in one spot and Roman would go all the way around and then he'd come up to Dickie and he'd stand next to Dickie and he'd look from where Dickie was looking at yeah. and say, Dick, this is a good place to yeah. shoot yeah. from. Yeah. 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 That was Dick Silver. He would stand in the place where he wanted Roman to shoot from. And it's also pre-production. Another thing that you guys had, pre-production. Imagine that. Well, and, yeah, and, and it was, it, again, Roman knew, and this is, I've worked with a lot of great directors before, but Roman knew exactly how he wanted to shoot way before we got there. He would take me, if you know the famous, of course, the always it was always over Jack's hat and shoulder. So much of the movie was that. Well, on our tech scout, he would just walk me around, this is where I want the camera. So uh, he was, uh, Roman, and for me, technically, he was the best director I ever got to work with. Sidney Pollack was the best director of actors that I got to work with. But, uh, so, um, I don't know. It made me wistful to hear this. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Um, these are all, these stories, and also, if you, those of you who don't know Hawk's career, you know, Hawk has a book, Magic Time, where he tells these stories and goes into the making of other movies that are, you know, equally huge, like, um, Heaven Can Wait, uh, The, the Way We Were, Marathon Man, um, all the way up to Primal Fear with Ed Norton, um, going back to Bob and Carol, and, and telling stories growing up with his dad, who was a head of Paramount. So these stories go back to Clark Gable, some of them. Um, um, it's cool to, 
So this is cool to talk to you about this stuff. I was going to ask if anybody here has a question. I mean, how much of the movie, we've heard uh, uh, Robert Town talk about writing the movie The Egyptian. How much does he deserve the, the Academy Award versus the other two guys, would you say? Is it like a third each or I don't know? Just talk about or not, not. And what's not in your book that you can tell us about tonight? <laughs> here, here. Uh, do, do, should the Academy Award be shared? I think the movie as we know it today is unimaginable without the three of them. That's my own personal opinion. Of course, I wasn't in the room every single day, but I can tell you that Eddie Taylor was with the exception of the days when Town was working with Roman, when it was just Town and Roman, and then they were themselves in the room every single day. So, you know, we can't know who did what, but I can tell you, Town came up with the idea and did a lot of it, and Eddie did a lot of it, and Roman, we've already... Um, Let me have it, I want to details. tell a story. And I know you know this, so it's not it's kind of crazy, but life isn't fair. <laughs> uh, I was lucky enough to be on a movie called uh, The Way We Were, uh, that was uh, um, the original writer uh, wrote the screenplay, but then uh, Sidney Pollack had a writer named David Rayfield who came in and did uh, some work, and then a gentleman who we just lost this last year, Alvin Sargent, mm -hmm. who won an Oscar for Julia came in and really wow. made the script what it was. But in arbitration, mm -hmm. even though everybody knew what Alvin had done, only the original writer got the screenplay credit. So yeah. sometimes, I'm just saying, life sometimes isn't fair. Uh, there you go. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. I, I just wanted to ask you a kind of a mundane question, but since you did a couple of pictures with Roman, um, how was he on the set? I mean, was it was it a workaday world, a first team rehearsal, Markham? Uh, what was it like to get the first shot in the morning with Roman Polanski? Great question. It was fun. <laughs> was, okay, guys. Okay, here we go. We're gonna be over here, right? And and as I tell this one story, we're out in the backyard of of her house, of the Mulray house. And he goes, Jack, okay, Jack, okay. Now turn your head like this. No, like this, Jack. Jack and turn and a little bit like this. How's, it, how's that for a camera? Okay, now, no, you'll be a little bit like that. Stay just like that, Jack. Just like that. Okay, roll. Roll, roll the camera. Okay, okay. Action, Jack. And Jack would go, hi. Roman, I can't talk. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Jack. <laughs> but yes, he was, he, yeah. We got the day's work. I mean, we talked about it. We figured where we were at lunch, all the stuff that you do. And he, again, on different than Rosemary's, on Chinatown, he was ready to go. So, you know. That's a great question. Uh, uh, well, this lady here. I'll come back to you after Okay, I was just trying to give a lady a question. So I know Faye Dunaway doesn't really like to talk about the movie, and, and a Guardian reporter tried to ask her this question, and she got so mad she threw the reporter out of her place. So I'm wondering. Hey, you're kidding. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if you guys know if it's true or not. So I've heard that Roman didn't like to let people go to the bathroom on the set, and Faye Dunaway rebelled against him by taking a cup of urine and splashing at him. Is that true? No, it's not true. No. She, no, it's not that Roman didn't like people going to the bathroom. Faye liked going to the bathroom on the set so that she didn't have to go out. She would go in a plant in the corner. <laughs> okay, my, que my question is kind of, I don't know, a, a big question. When, you, when the movie was being made, did you have any idea that it was going to be the Torah of filmmaking? And why, second two-part question, why do you think it has exceeded almost, you know, it's in the top ten of movies of all time? What, could you answer that question? I know it's a profound one. Uh, well, the first question is, we didn't know it was going to be what it is today, but all of us knew that it was a special script. We knew we had the best craftsmen in the business working. We knew that Roman was a genius artist, and so... You know, we had fun making it because you felt the energy behind it. Why it's stayed, I'm going to let him say. I think it's a lot of things. One, the production is as beautiful as any production has ever been. Everyone, like Hawk said, is the best working at their best. And that's not just true of Giant Town. 
That's true of Godfather 1 and 2. It's true of Rosemary. I mean, it's true of a lot of these movies that were made at Paramount under Evans. Chinatown has a couple other things going for it that I think pushes it up to another level. One, it has this ending, which is virtually unique, as I've said, in American movies. Um, two, um, um, it took a genre that really was associated more with, I don't want to say, well, it took the noir genre, which never, which rarely took on something this metaphysical. And, and you know, as great as Double Indemnity is, is my favorite movie. It is about what it's about. It, 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 it doesn't really have much by way of metaphor. You look at Raymond Chandler, the greatest, some of my favorite books, there are really a lot of atmosphere. You don't know the story, the characters, the Raymond Chandler plot, you know, as, as Faulkner famously said when he was adapting The Big Sleep. What is this about? <laughs> Who did it? I'm paraphrasing. But Faulkner couldn't follow it. Chinatown has got something giant on its mind. Add to that this tradition of the genre, all the other things. And one more thing that puts it over the top, which is a little bit of a cynical read. Um, when, when, when screenplays started, you know, people started selling screenplays for a lot of money. Uh, after the, about the time Chinatown came out, and Sid Field put it together that there was a formula that could be taught and could be sold. And if you wanted to come to Hollywood and you couldn't make it as an actor, and you didn't have the camera to be a director, if you wanted to, if you wanted to buy your lottery ticket, Sid Field's book Screenplay in 1979 was your way to go. I don't mean to put down the book; it got a lot of things right. But Sid Field picked Chinatown, so. It became the, officially became the Torah. And so people who, and they still do it today. Except for Robert McKee, who picked Casablanca. Who picked Casablanca, yeah, right, right. And it's ridiculous to say one is better than the other. Right. We're ha we love both of them. But uh, Field got in there first, and then that became the one that everyone, suddenly someone decided that there was the Great Gatsby. And everyone agreed on that, whether they agreed with it or not. It had been announced. So its reputation was solidified there. Um, I have a question. Um, you, you, um, you said that 1975 was the year when things started to change and the magic, you know, became lost. Why did, why did we lose it? And do you think that it could come back? Good question. Money. Money. Well, I don't have good news on the second part. Of <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Some people boo. <laughs> As if I did it. Um, uh, yeah. Um, why did it change? Um, uh, there was... Uh, it's, it's, it's a giant and complex question. Jaws is a good way to talk about it. Um, what happened with Jaws is, um, and, and also with a movie called Billy Jack. You guys remember Billy Jack? Yeah. 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 I was yeah of course, I forgot. Yes, of course. So with Billy Jack, they, they, they really realized if you could market the hell out of something, I mean, just really put so much money into the selling of something, beyond just what Hollywood was used to, which was, a trailer and a poster in the lobby and some carefully placed items in the newspaper and maybe Pauline would go nuts, you know? Uh, that would be it. That's not, that's not expensive. Hollywood with Billy Jack realized if you sell, 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 and then with Jaws, buy commercial time, use the television, and force it down their throats. Well, not only could you sell them garbage, but because it's so expensive to do this, the tail starts to wag the dog, and all the money goes into marketing. Well, what are we going to market? We have to market something that hit, hit well last time because we're not going to do a one-minute commercial on Last Tango in Paris, you know, and flood it. We've got to show them a shark in 30 seconds. We have the, the, 
and then now that, that starts to inform what screenplays get picked. So it's reverse engineered all the way to the point of the fellow or, or gal writing, starts to write her screenplay. Now he or she is going to have to think about whether she knows it or not, what those marketing folks are thinking about. Well, that's not how Chinatown was written. That's not how Chinatown could be written. So the whole unconscious part of creativity, which is essential to generating anything new, has now gone out the window. Um, and we haven't gone back since. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Koch. Uh, what are the background or circumstances that Rome, Roman Polanski uh, put himself into the picture and had a pivotal scene where he slices Jack Nicholson? Uh, well, he, he Rome's a bit of a ham. <laughs> and he thought that would be a good spot for him to be in. And uh, I've told the story before, but it is he said to the crew before we ever started shooting, I want to put the knife in Jack's nose. I'm not going to fake it. We didn't have this effects then, no CGI, none of that stuff. So can we figure out how to do it? And the special effects guys, nobody can figure out how to do it. Roman figured it out. He said, I want to, on the end of the knife, I want to put a, 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 a uh, yes, not not retractable, a, a hinge. Yeah, yeah. He said, because when, when I pull it out, it will hinge down and come back so fast that nobody will see it. And then Jack had a little bladder filled with blood in his, I'm sorry, Roman had a little bladder in his hand with a little tube up so that he was holding the knife with that. So as he did that, your natural thing is to squeeze. So on take one, and first of all, Roman and Jack really had fun with this because he'd stick, he'd keep sticking the nut. Uh, Roman, what are you doing? Are we shooting? Are we shooting? You know, he said, no, no, Jack, we're practicing. You know, whatever. And then, then on take one, it was perfect, absolutely perfect. But in those days, we didn't have video playback or anything. So Roman said, I want to do it again and again and he, about twelve times. And he kept putting the Roman, please. I, and finally, after take 12, Jack said, that's it, I'm done. Take one is in the mood. <laughs> so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes. Um, I have a question, uh, two part. Jerry Goldsmith, was yes. the, uh, there, his soundtrack seems like a lot of people copied it afterwards, like LA Confidential. Was there something special with what he did? Because I think it was. And then also, a quick question for Hawk. Uh, is it true the story about Frank Sinatra and, and uh, his wife on Rosemary's Baby about how she was served papers because, they, because Polanski went way over? Well, yes. That, that's, the, the first question is Jerry Goldsmith. Yes, it's true there was a score done by a friend of Roman's, and uh, we were about four weeks from opening the movie, and Roman had to leave to go, I forget where he was going. Uh, uh, he was doing, doing the some, opera in Spoleto. Yeah, he was doing an opera in Spoleto, and Bob, who had big cojones, said this doesn't work, this, the music doesn't work, and he went to Jerry Goldsmith, who, for those of you who may not know, was nominated, I think, 17 times, he only won one. For, for the omen. Yeah. It was the only one he won for. And you think of the score, forget it, Chinatown, Patton, think of that score. Yeah. Amazing. At any rate, Jerry, in like days from nothing, created what I think is one of the most amazing scores. And on Rosemary's Baby, yes, Roman went over. Mia was supposed to leave to go do a movie called The Detective that Frank was producing and starring in Fox. And because we kept going over and over, and I mean, you know, Frank was probably 50 and Mia was 21. So there were other things involved there. And, but, you know, Jack, I mean, Frank actually, you know, did say, you know, he gave her an ultimatum. Either you leave the movie or we're getting divorced. And she wasn't going to leave the movie. And one day um, we're on the set and Mickey Rudin, her lawyer, his lawyer, comes on the stage and hands her the divorce paper. And she cried, and it was a horrible time, I guess that's true. Uh, Sam, I, <clears throat> I, I didn't hear as uh, clearly as I could have 
Uh, you said that, uh, you know, uh, town has been on the record of, on this film for about 46 years, but you did not reach out to him, because he's here, of course. Why not just go to him and double check and plumb him? Did, did, did you or did you not? Yeah, we talked to him several times and was told, you know, sometimes he didn't get back, a couple times it was busy, there were all number of excuses. I made my Yes. Okay. Yeah, the second uh, part, uh, Hawk, the, um, uh, I only just noticed this about two years ago, but outside, there's a shot outside the Mar Vista rest home when they're taking off, and you can see in the far distance uh, a couple of 70s cars. Wait, I didn't do my job. <laughs> <laughs> and I was surprised because you guys were so exacting. And I gotta look at that, you sure? I saw it on YouTube, and I looked at it two or three times. Wow, I'm going to go home and I video on my seat. You know, maybe they changed the matting. I don't know how to shoot it. Is it possible? Yeah. Well, possibly. We yeah. shot it 185. Maybe that mat was, yeah. you know, bigger. Right. 166, right. maybe. A comment and then a question. So what you said about marketing, in a way, destroying Hollywood, that's what's happened to pharmaceuticals, too? Marketing is in charge of pharmaceuticals. There's no more blind testing. It's all cherry pick fake results run by the marketing people who are trying to repurpose stuff they have with new names and new brands. Wow. So protect yourself. Pharmageddon's a good book. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you work with so many amazing directors. What did you learn from them, and what did you learn about them? Short form of that. Short form of that. The dummy. So many, though. Uh, what did I learn from them? I learned, I learned the ones who knew what they were doing and the ones who didn't. Uh, I learned not just from the directors, but there's a great story in my book uh, about working with Robert Benton on his first movie as a director. Robert Benton and his partner David Newman wrote Bonnie and Clyde, and then Benton went on to direct Kramer vs. Kramer, Places in the Heart. Uh, many others, but fabulous man. But we he hired Gordon Willis, one of the great cinematographers, to be on the movie. And Gordy sat me, because I was the AD, and Ben down. And every day for two weeks, we'd sit with the script. And Ben would say that, I mean, uh, Gordy would say to Ben, okay, scene one, do you see it wide? Do you see it close? Do you see it moving? Do you see it stationary? Do you see it high? Do you see it low? How do you see the transition from scene one to scene two? Do you want to be moving to moving, stationary to stationary? And, and Benton had to, as a director, think through. And Gordy and I, because we were going to be the ones running everything, took notes of everything. And then we said to uh, Benton at the end of the two weeks, of course you can change your mind, but at least we have a plan. And what I found with people like Roman and Sidney and Alan Pakula, uh, not so much Warren, uh, <laughs> but you know, some a lot of great directors, their plan, and they really knew exactly what they wanted. So that's probably what I learned. Great. Uh, yeah, um, LA's been stealing water for centuries, uh, <laughs> and how much of the Mulholland uh, context is in the movie? Uh, he was the head of L.A. Water and Power, I believe, and the primary motivator in stealing water and building dams. How much was that in the movie? A, a lot of it, and it's, and, and, but Town had to, this was a big challenge. Town, I mean, Town had to condense a lot of bad guys into one guy. So if you, if you read the, the book that Town read, which um, started him on the story, uh, which everyone should read, as Angelinos. Everyone should read one of the great books ever written about LA. Island Title. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> My mother, ladies and gentlemen. I'm kidding, I don't know who you are. Best line of the night. <laughs> um, You're okay. And, and, and Island on the Land, Southern California, Island on the Land, by Carrie McWilliams. It is the book about that. This is the book. If you are from here and you love this city, or if you hate this city, I mean, it, it, this is the book that will tell you who you are. This is the DSM for LA. Uh, and it is, uh, unlike a lot of works of nonfiction, this is a beautifully written, even poetic book. And none of its poetry in any way gets in the way of its research. Anyhow, in this book, there is a chapter called Water, Water, Water. 
and Town read this chapter. And um, um, you can even see, I found at one point, the McWilliams says, someone raped the land. And there's your B story right there. I mean, that's your A story and your B story right there. So Town took all this information, which will tell you more than I can tell you right now. Mulholland is in there, and there are a lot of other bad guys. Yes. Van Nuys? Yeah. He wasn't Van Nuys. Yeah, all your streets. Yeah. A couple more, and then we'll all go out to dinner. So I just wanted to ask, and it piggybacks on the other two questions, but what was the inspiration for Town for the movie? Was all this history about the drama of water in L.A.? Or, and, that, and then it evolved into, there's also the story about like, the rape and the melodrama on top of it. But it was very uh, detailed about that, uh, that kind of event here. The question, yeah, so what started Town on this? Town is from L.A., he's from San Pedro, he left San Pedro pretty, pretty early. Um, his father was uh, in the real estate business, and they moved up to Brentwood, and lived off San Vicente. Um, and so Town grew up here, and um, after the murders, the Manson murders, um, uh, Town had reason to look back at the L.A. that was no longer the L.A. that he knew. The and innocence. The innocence, Corrupt, yes. but innocent. Exactly, <laughs> right, right. Um, and uh, he knew he wanted to do something about L.A. Uh, after the murders. He read a piece in New West Magazine. It was called New West. New West Magazine, um, right after the murders. That was also looking back. And it looked back on Chandler's L.A., Raymond Chandler's L.A. Not Chandler as in the Times, Raymond Chandler's L.A. So he's looking back over Sharon Tate, and who he knew a little bit uh, through his wife, Julie Payne. And there he's looking at the old Plymouths, and he's looking at the old um, uh, 40s architecture, and he's thinking about Raymond Chandler, and um, he goes up to... Um, Eugene, Oregon, where Nicholson is making um, Drive, you said. Right, and Town's going to do a little rewrite, a little bit, appear in the movie. And he says to Julie, who's up there with him, I'm going to do this thing, I'm do it with Jack. We're going to make Jack a movie star. I mean, we're going to make Jack a romantic lead, which he had not been up to that point. And we're going to do it in LA. Go to the library and get me some research. And Julie is a was a research fanatic. I mean, this is he he married the right Julie, and she had never big Julie. Big, he he, he <laughs> guys and dogs. Picked this she picked this book off the shelf, which she had never heard of, but there it was. Brought it back to town in Eugene, Oregon. He read this chapter, Water, 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 and I think he saw rape the land in that. In there, rape the land. And then there you go. These are all great questions, and I want to tell you so many of them um, are answered in the book. <laughs> so if you want to know more, uh, I was just thinking about how many, how many, how I could have answered the question having having read the book. <laughs> so that was great. So I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. It's wonderfully written. Um, I uh, want to. Uh, I guess I'm not. I guess I'm glad I'm a librarian. I'm not gonna, because I know I'm not gonna get a job in audio in this town. Uh, so I'm sorry for that. No, it worked out fine. Um, and uh, I'm so honored that both of you came this evening. A wonderful conversation. Two people who knew the subject. I mean, I've had conversations before, but I've never had an exchange of two people who were so knowledgeable about the same thing. <laughs> so that was just great. So thank you for thank coming. You for and um, they'll sign some books for you over there. Thank you all for coming. This